Hello, this is David Mandel with uh, CIS240L Linux Systems Administration. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this week's material. This week we're doing Chapter 7 in the book. This is week 6 of the course. And uh, we're doing Chapter 7. Um, the lab that I've given you for this week is to write another uh, shell script, a born shell script or bash shell script. And um, hopefully one a little more sophisticated than you did last week. And, um, and we'll talk about that tonight. That, that will be the topic of tonight. Before we get started, though, we should discuss our routine things, discuss what's on Caligator.org, because one of these days you're going to have to review an open source event. So um, Caligator.org is an events calendar telling you about the events in the Portland area. This week, like most weeks, there's quite a few events, uh, open source type events in the Portland area. Um, I'll just uh, highlight one here. On Thursday night, there is um, Plug. Um, the Portland Linux Unix group, which I coordinate, is having a meeting where we're going to discuss two topics, uh, hands-on IPv6 and web hosting with GitHub. Um, this should be good. Um, this is kind of the um, the last session of a several se session uh, um, series on IPv6, but uh, it would still be valuable to go. If you don't know anything about IPv6, um, the one thing to know is the world is moving from IPv4, which we have been using, to IPv6. And it, we have to move very quick, soon on this because parts of the world are completely, totally out of IPv4 IP addresses to give to people. So this is a big change coming up. And what does that mean for you and I? That means they're going to need a lot of IPv6 consultants in the next couple years. This is going to be a big field. Um, and there's going to be a couple years work for a lot of people in that. So um, it's time to get some background in it um, for me as well as you. I don't know much about IPv6. But I do know it's going to be a big area. Um, and um, you can always find out about what's going on with the Portland Linux Unix group by going to their home, their web page, their home site at pdxlinux.org. Um, OK. Other things I might mention just in way of passing is I put this on our um, discussion list. I found a little thing lately, a little board called the Raspberry Pi, which is being developed by a nonprofit in uh, Britain. And it's basically just a little board that's you know maybe three inches by three inches or something like that. No case to it, no anything. It's just a little board. But what's on this board is a small computer based on an ARM chip, that uh, Intel ARM chip that runs Linux, and um, and they're going to market it at a retail price of twenty-five dollars, which is incredibly cheap for a. Um, basically, everything you need for a small computer. Um, and it runs Linux, of course. Um, it will have access to an HDMI port, I believe, so you can connect video to it or even a television. It will also have uh, some USB connectors. And you need to do something like supply USB power to it or something of that type to power the thing. Because of course, it comes. It's just a raw board with no power, no case, no anything. But I still think that's a pretty incredible buy. And um, uh, hopefully, they're going to be available to purchase in about a month. And I figure I will buy a couple of them because uh, they sound like a lot of fun. So. Uh, They'd be great to use, like in robots and things of that type. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to also mention, by way of passing, that um, um, Supercomputing 2011 is coming to Seattle in a couple weeks. Um, 
I hope to go up to it. Um, I was just going to mention that this is a cool conference. It's a big time conference. Unfortunately, that means big dollars and everything like that. But um, all the big scientific computing people go to it. The people interested in parallel computers, where they have one computer piled on another one, piled on another one, piled on another one, and then they wire them all together and run software between them that coordinates all of them to make um, machines that can do um, run big mathematical models to um, simulate things like um, El Nino activities with or, or uh, climate modeling. Um, the activities in the core of a nuclear power plant, things of that type. Um, and it's really a cool, cool fun field. Um, and um, if you ever get a chance to go to one of these, I, I highly recommend it because it really introduces you to a totally new, different field and a way of thinking. And um, so let's go back to our outline here. Um, that is most everything I had to say. I was just going to add one little blurb here that in the newspapers all the time, we read about projects, big, huge computer projects that failed, usually government projects. But believe me, this happens in the private sector just as often as it does in the public sector. It's just that um, if it's in the private sector, they keep it quiet and it doesn't make the newspapers. But uh, recently, we read about the Oregon State Radio Project as being a project where they'd spent lots and lots of money on an emergency system that doesn't work. Um, uh, not long before that, we read about the National Archives that spent tons of money um, on a, um, a computer project that apparently isn't working very well. Um, you may recall Metro 5, which was a system that uh, was supposed to give us wireless access across the city of Portland that is now being dismantled after the company putting it together um, went bankrupt. The only saving grace of this project was that our city forefathers were wise enough that while they did believe a lot of Metro 5's pie in the sky promises, they they did not spend hardly any public money on the project. And um, so uh, at least there's very little tax money lost on that project. And the truth is, mostly that's reputation that was lost. Um, but um, so the question is, why do these projects fail all the time? Well, it's my theory that the basic problem with these projects is that they are promising us a revolutionary change in computing. We're going to change everything. Just give us $500 million and we will, and we'll promise you anything in the world. And normally, they just can't deliver. Instead, a much better approach to computing is to start with a small computing system and evolve it with time. Uh, thus, um, I promote evolution, not revolution. <laughs> the idea is never promise more, too much more than you can deliver. And evolve your system, add a system here or there. It may not be totally compatible with what you're doing, but you can kind of make it sort of compatible. And if the whole thing's a disaster, it's a small disaster to write off so that you're never losing a lot of money or a lot of rev reputation. And some of these things will succeed. And when they succeed, then you get more of them and add to, you know, add to the projects that are successful and just quietly let the ones die that are not so successful. So it's sort of survival of the fittest. Um, through more of an evolutionary approach than a revolutionary approach. OK, well, we should start on with our topics. As I said um, before, we're going to be discussing uh, the bash shell tonight, the material in Chapter 7, which will be the bash shell and um, a bash scripting. And 
other topics that are associated with Bash scripting. So with that, I say goodbye, and I will start up um, uh, later with the other videos.